Sonia, welcome to Art and Cocktails. I'm so excited to chat with you today. It's such an honor to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here with you today. So excited. And it was such a pleasure to meet you in Paris a few weeks ago. I can't believe it's already been last month. But um, I'm so passionate about the work that you're doing, both as an art collector and as an educator and curator. Can you tell our audience, for those who don't know you, who are you and what do you do? Yes. So my, my story has been evolving over the years. I am an art enthusiast since I was really, really little girl. And I really enjoy drawing, painting, and I consider myself an artist, even if I don't sell my art or anything, but my, my collection is like a big piece of art for me. So what I like um, is to, to, to meet a lot of artists, get connected with them, understand their work, and then when, when, when I really understand their work and I like the piece, I buy them, you know? The thing is that I started collecting uh, 16 years ago when I was a little bit sad because my son was sick. But then uh, from then I discovered that art was making me happy and it did make me happy during my youth and it helped me in all the bad times of my life. So I always enjoy going to museums. I always enjoy going to galleries, visiting artists' studios and to have artists at home to have the art at home from the artist and meet the artist at home sometimes for a coffee is so refreshing that for me, it's like, it's my passion, you know, I need art. So some people need coffee in the morning. I need art when I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way, you know, both as an artist and someone who just loves the art community so much. And in your wonderful book, which is so incredible, Art in Real Time, which I'm almost finished reading, you kind of share a little bit about your journey and how when you were younger, you were very interested in drawing and painting and, you know, you had this passion, but as many of us, our families encourage us to pursue something more practical. Can you talk about kind of like, even as you were not necessarily pursuing a career in art at the beginning, how art was kind of a part of your life anyway, like some of the things that helped you stay connected with that part of yourself. And later on, what was kind of the turning point for you to jump fully back into this world? Yes, for me, since young age, I always like to go to museums. And uh, I think like I started going to museums when I was like 15, 16 year old. Then my parents were not very much into art. So I had to convince like my grandparents or my great grandmother to come with me, you know, or during trips. The good thing is that my family, they like traveling. So always when, when we did trips, we went uh, to Egypt, Indonesia, or the, the United States, New York, you know, Paris, around everywhere in Europe. So we always visit like kind of not, we, I mean, we, it wasn't, there were no trips only about going to museums. But we always managed to, to see something, you know. So during my last years of high school, my great grandmother, she didn't have very good health, but she didn't want to stop traveling. So I was traveling with her in bus, by bus in Europe, you know, and then uh, she, she would let me choose wherever I wanted to go. So we did several trips. She was like almost 90 year old and we were traveling around and I, 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 she knew that I had a lot of passion for museums and museums were like something that I needed to, to see. I, I, I was obsessed with the Renaissance, you know, and uh, always in my early years, I was uh, collecting these uh, magazines that they came every week about Leonardo da Vinci, you know. So for me, it's like to read the little magazine of Leonardo da Vinci and copy the drawings and then afterwards, like, let's say, like, three or four years later, going to all these museums in Florence and Rome, it was, like, incredible. So I was always very, very much connected with art. And uh, I was lucky that some people around me helped me to, to, to stay connected. I always wanted to try to be an artist. So always when I came home, I was copying from my pictures or, or from the book I bought. I was super, super enthusiastic, you know. And my grand, great-grandmother, she was always supporting me and uh, always like making all these dreams possible, you know. Then when I came to London uh, in 1995, after I finished my education in law, uh, I spent the first three months every afternoon in one museum or musical. Because uh, for me, I consider like dance, 
music, musicals, uh, theater, and art, a, a part of the same thing, you know? People give so much when, when, when they do different types of art that you absorb their energy, you know? So for me, for instance, when I go to a museum, I feel I absorb the energy of, from the artworks, you know? The same when I go and see a theater play. So all these things, they have been um, keeping me very, very connected to the art world. And I didn't really start collecting until later on, let's say year 2008 or seven, eight, more or less. At the beginning, I collected because uh, I liked art and I wanted to have some pieces at home. Before that, I was painting my own pieces and decorating my home with my own pieces. Oh, so cool. I love that. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. so, thank you so much for sharing that. And I love that you were always connected to art and you are an artist at heart too. But can you share a little bit of perspective? You have this confidence and just passion for art, but you probably met people, I know I certainly have, that are not in the art world. Maybe they're in business or law or medicine, and they might be interested, but it's a really intimidating world, especially with like contemporary galleries. Do you have any insight for how maybe to introduce someone who is passionate about learning more, but they don't know how to get started? And they just feel like they don't know anything and they feel you know, out of place and they don't know how to talk about it. What are some tips for people who might want to get in touch with that creative side and start to introduce themselves to the arts? Yes, because many people, they have been maybe drawing when they were young and they like it, but they didn't have the opportunity to have people around them to take them to museums, open the door of galleries, or they didn't know anyone. I think I would recommend people to start going to museums more than galleries. Mm. I mean, because in the museum, you really see very high quality art and you can identify yourself with the type of art you like, and you can see if it resonates with you or not. Because many people like art in general, but they don't know which type of art. It's like more, some people like abstract, some people figurative, some people really like like all the styles like modern art, you know, or Renaissance, Baroque. So I think it's important, like if you live in a, in, a, in a big city or you have the opportunity to go to the biggest museum of your city, this should be the starting point. Mm, I agree. I think, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I think once you have been uh, through a, a few museums, like let's say two or three museums, and then you will see, okay, this is the, the type of art I like. And then you maybe you can start going to galleries. To go to galleries, all these very posh contemporary galleries, like let's say when you are walking around London, Mayfair, or in Paris, Avenue Matignon, or in New York, you know, sometimes it could be a little bit intimidating. But there is another thing you can do. For instance, if you go to London or New York or Paris, if you have the opportunity, Start with auction houses because oh, normally, yes. And for instance, now recently when we met in Paris, I went to Sotheby's and Christie's in, uh, in the Avenue Matignon, you know, they had incredible artworks from the next uh, um, auctions that they were, they were conducting. And it was super interesting because they have different type of art. And there you can see abstract, you can see, for instance, I remember it was a rose from, from Dali, like super surrealistic, but then uh, you, you had other artists, like nothing to be, you know? So it's a very good way to introduce yourself to art. And if you want to learn about the value of art, go the day of the auction and sit there to watch. Mm, and nobody will tell you anything. Yes. I nobody love that. will tell you anything, you know? I've learned a lot by watching auctions and if you don't have the opportunity to go in person just do it online but in person if you do one or two auctions in person you will learn so much about the bidding process as well and you 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 will see how much enthusiasm there is around certain pieces Mm, oh my gosh, that's brilliant advice. I never thought of that. And I love reading about it, but I never thought to actually participate and just go watch it. Thank you for that amazing tip. And I, I agree, even when I read the articles about like what sold at auction, it's always like an explanation, the story and why it's valuable. I think that is so brilliant. Thank you so much for that nugget. Now, speaking of the enthusiasm and the passion that people have for the arts, kind of 
um, bringing it back to the artists themselves. Sometimes I feel like artists just think like, oh, it's fun for me or it's important for me to create this work, but they don't realize that the collectors and people who appreciate their art also experience the benefits of the work. And something you share that's so powerful in your book about that colorful painting that you know your family purchased when your son was ill. Can you talk a little bit about the kind of healing properties as a collector and the joy and the, you know, the blessings really that art brings to someone who might not even make art yes I think um, art has healing properties and is very important for every moment in your life to be surrounded with the different type of art that can give you comfort because for instance when I was sad I started collecting black paintings and the people that they know me now, they will think, this is impossible, Sonia, I know you. How? I don't believe you have black paintings. Yes, I have black paintings at home and I have. I still have all the artworks I bought 16 years ago. I haven't sold one piece because I'm a, I'm a collector for love. And when I consider that when you have a collection of art, you it's like it's a reflection of your life over the years. So for instance, if you want... Many people, maybe they like art, but they don't want to have all the house full of artworks, but they would like to, to have some pieces that they give them comfort or they tell them good night or they tell them good morning or they share a coffee with them in the morning. You know, it's, it's very different to wake up in the morning and see a white wall than see an artwork in front of you. If you are in a sad period of your life, maybe you need something like dark with the browns and blacks and maybe something abstract that you can get lost when you are looking at it, you know? But then when your life progresses and if, if, if you, you feel more comfortable and more happy, maybe you start dressing in colors. And when you start dressing in colors, you will choose more colorful artwork for your home. And then in different rooms, you always need different ambience, you know? Maybe the kitchen is the place where all the family meets. So you need a lot of colors to create dialogue, you know? Maybe in the bedroom, you want to have more like calm colors because when you go to bed, you, you want something that gives you comfort with like this pale blue or maybe even pale pink or beige, you know? So for me, it's very important. And in the different periods of my life, I never sell the artworks. I change them around the house. And maybe if there are some artworks that they made me sad because it reminds me of, of a sad period, I put them in a room that normally I don't enter. And then I, I, I move the artworks around. So I have a handyman at home that comes every three, four, five months. And then we move the artworks around, you know? And it's so funny because the I whole house. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. And it's so true, even for artists listening, you know, we don't have to always make a certain type of work and responding, whether it's through decorating or curating our collection with the kind of state that we're in and honoring that instead of fighting it or, you know, pretending things are okay, like using art as a way to be seen. There's actually a great book. I don't know if you read it, Art as Therapy. And it talks about like the power of art to help people feel seen and the empathy they feel um, you know, and the understanding that the artist has gone through something similar is very powerful for people. So thank you so much for sharing that from the collector's perspective. I love that so, so much. And speaking of collection, so in your book, you have this beautiful breakdown of different tiers of how people can start collecting work. And this goes to artists too, because I know many artists are also collectors. I know I collect a lot of work and my friends collect my work and it's just like this beautiful community thing. Can you it's like, take me through, let's say someone's interested in becoming a collector for the love of art, not for flipping. Or <laughs> that's a whole other thing. But for just like really bringing art into their life, whether they're an art enthusiast or artist themselves, what would you say are the first few steps that someone can take to bring some art into their life? Yes. One of the first steps is when you know that you want to buy something for your home, make sure that you buy something that you really like. Because, you know, it, art is a little bit like fashion for some people. And many women, more than men, they buy an artwork and the year after don't like it. Mm. Okay? Because they have changed taste. But many times it's because you were conditioned when you bought it. Okay? So make sure that, for instance, you go to a gallery, you talk to the galleries, and uh, there are like some pieces that you like, you really admire these artists, and you would like to buy something, you know? And then you choose... 
and you decide that you want this artwork and then the galleries try to convince you of something else. Normally, the first impression is the good one. OK, so don't change your mind because maybe that piece of art was sold to another collector and then it's not available and they try to convince you on something else. So what I will advise, always go for first choice. OK, so for instance, you enter a gallery and then you see 10 artworks hanging there and always there is one calling you. Always, maybe attracts you because you don't like it or attracts you because you really love it. Mm -hmm. Go directly to this artwork. And if this one is the one calling you, choose that one because then you will never regret. But if you are like, you go three or four days and then one day you go with your husband, another day you go with your friends, another day you go with the gallerist, you know, and they try to convince you on something else. In the end, the, the, the first impression will be the right one, you know? So always buy what you love and never let a gallerist, for instance, or anybody manipulate you because the other artwork is better sized because it will be a better value, because you will be able to resell it, because it's going to be a very good investment. Look, 99% of the artworks, nobody knows if they're going to be a good investment or not. So you don't want to fill your house full of art you don't like, starting there. And if you believe in an artist, and you, you want to follow the artist all their life, this is a super nice thing because I always recommend the people to buy artists from their generation because then they can grow together, they can go to the shows together, you know, and maybe every year or every two, three years, you can buy another artwork. You see the evolution of the artist. And it has happened to me that some artists I've been following for 16 years, they have evolved incredible now. Others, they're still in the same. You know, mm -hmm. and others they have evolved very, very well, and the, but their price is still the same. But never the price doesn't make the quality, and this is what many people don't understand, because there are a lot of manipulation in the market, and people could think that oh, okay, uh, this is expensive, this is good. No, <laughs> in, this, in this moment you can pay maybe fifty thousand for an artwork, and in two years maybe this artist has been forgotten because it's not true to himself. Because the real art comes from the heart of the artist that wants to show you the, 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 how he felt or she felt on that moment, how they felt, what do they wanted to transmit on that moment. And if you don't feel anything when you look at this artwork, I will I recommend not to buy it. Some art, artworks and artists that I love, I feel that they are not for my collection because maybe they don't resonate with my taste. And uh, for instance, I don't buy abstract and I don't know why, but I need a kind of figurative, even if the artwork is a bit abstract, but it has to have a kind of eyes or face that you can see or something. I don't know. For me, the eyes, they are calling me, you know, for every person is different. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And just as a reminder to really honor your own personal taste and aesthetic and what you're drawn to. I think so many times, yeah, people get caught up in like the facts and the value, but at the end of the day, you have to live with it, like you said. And that's so, so, so true. Um, I want to ask you if you could share for our artist community, you know, they are also collectors, but <laughs> for those looking to grow in the art world and meet amazing collectors, you know, such as yourself, what do you look for and what advice would you give artists really looking to stand out and be professional and, you know, speak to their audience? Mm -hmm. I think the artists, they should not paint for other people. Mm. They have to paint for themselves. So they should not follow the advice. Maybe some galleries are going to kill me here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. This is for the artists. <laughs> yes, this is for the artists. They should not follow what the galleries tell them when it's not in the right moment for their career. Let's say, for instance, there's one artist that makes a show super successful with one theme, you know? And then the galleries have sold everything. And then they are asking the artist to paint something very, very similar again for the next show in six months. If the artist feels that at this point in this career, they don't want to paint more, I don't know, trees or <laughs> birds or anything, they should not do it because then it will be an art that they paint from their brain and they don't paint from their heart. Mm -hmm. So it will not be the same than the first show. So the artist first, it needs to feel that it's evolving. And there is another thing very important. Never stay on your comfort zone. Because many artists, they are doing that and they follow and continue painting the same and the same and the same. And to be in the comfort zone, 
is the enemy of the artist. So always you have to be like, you know, when you go into the ocean and you are walking and then you feel that your water is, <laughs> yeah, you almost can't, you are on the tiptoes and you almost can't breathe because the water reaches your nose <laughs> and your yeah. mouth, you know, that is the right place to be when you are an artist, you know? Oh, I love that. But, yes, it has to be like, you are kind of a little bit uncomfortable, but you still can manage. I love and, that so much. Yes, is, this is the best feeling for, for an artist because then they are experimenting on new things and the collectors can perceive that. Yes, thank you for sharing that. As an artist, I experienced this too and I always kind of fought back, but there is this kind of, it's kind of like a little bit lazy, you know, just keep making that thing. And I always, I always listen to my own intuition, but there was a mentor I had early on that said, don't ever paint interiors. Cause that's how I started. And then my interiors took off. And then of course, everyone's like paint only interiors. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm moving on. <laughs> and it's so interesting. I think people just want, like you said, to be in that comfort zone, to have something safe that they know sold before, but that's not what art is. Art is the expression. And like you said, it has to come from the heart. So thank you for that reminder and affirmations and let me ask you this it was there an artist that maybe you followed that started with a certain type of work and evolves and maybe you didn't resonate but then later on you connected with a different work can you talk about what it's like as a collector that maybe the artist really changes and how do you respond to that yes because the artist for instance sometimes you meet an artist you buy the artwork you like it and maybe uh, three or four years later you continue following the the artist and you don't like this the new style but the artists, they need to experiment and come back. And there is another thing that I think is very important as a collector that I would like to tell artists that not every year is for making money. And some years are for selling and some years are for experimenting. And it's very important for the artists to find themselves again because an artist, when they choose their profession, is because they really want to become an artist. And at the beginning, when they choose their profession, they are not thinking about money because maybe if not, they will be a banker. That's right. Homeless, you know, they will, they will become something else. So sometimes when, for instance, after COVID, many artists sold a lot of artworks, you know, and they thought, oh, this is going to be my new normal. No, that was the exception. And then they were keeping doing the same and the same and the same again. And then when they change, all of a sudden they didn't sell anything. But that's okay because they need to evolve because they have to realize internally, because sometimes an artist that maybe was very happy, painting very happy paintings, they, they are experimenting a period of melancholy and they need to experiment on this melancholy. And they, the other times will come back, you know? I, for instance, 16 years ago, when we bought the green mouse, based in the chapter one in the book, you know, I was not ready for that. My <laughs> husband and my kids wanted the green mouse and I didn't want it because I was collecting more like Barocco style, black, and you know. And then this artist was evolving from this type of very childish, bad art, let's say, to more complex and very uh, defined figures, you know, still childish, but very defined. But I believe that he will evolve again, you know, and I like more the first uh, style that I bought 16 years ago now that maybe I didn't like it when my family bought it, you know, mm -hmm. but I got used to. And when you analyze it, it was very basic painting that tells you a lot. Sometimes many artists, they want to be very perfectionist. And when you go into perfection, you paint with your brain. Mm. Mm. Such a great reminder. Yeah, it's a reminder that like when it becomes too perfect, you need to do an exercise of going more towards abstraction and come back. You know, never forget that you have to paint from your inner side. That's such a beautiful reminder. Thank you so much. Everyone needs to get that tattooed <laughs> on their <laughs> forehead. And just remember, yeah, and I, this is why I'm so passionate also about like one, one thing that I love to do is just empower artists to be financially smart and independent because there are moments where your work might not be selling as well. Like you said, after the market kind of went down after COVID, it was panic time. And I was said, I, I always wanted to make sure I knew how to support myself without putting pressure on my art or like manipulating my own practice just so that it can sell. Right. Because that doesn't feel good. And it doesn't, 
it doesn't really add to our legacy as artists and protecting that experimentation, like you said, and that creative freedom is so, so important. So thank you so much for sharing that. I want to ask you, so I met you at the beautiful exhibition in Paris, which was so lovely. Can you tell me, how did you transition from first art lover and artist to art collector to now curating and creating opportunities for other artists? I would love to hear this part of your journey. Yes. For me, I consider myself an artist and an art collector. So I'm the artist of my collection. <laughs> this is the first thing. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Then um, I know a lot of galleries because I, I'm a client of them, you know. And then uh, I decided to write the book because a lot of artists, especially artists and new collectors, they were contacting me through Instagram and they wanted advice. And uh, they were asking me, do you think this artwork is good? Do you think this artwork is bad? I mean, every day I receive hundreds of requests of, of people by email or by Instagram asking me. And I try to answer everyone. Sometimes it's difficult, but I try even if it's like a two or three sentences to guide them a little bit, you know. Then uh, I decided to write the book uh, because then I could reach more people with the advice. Yes. Through the book, I talked to the gallery in Paris, the gallery is Vero. And uh, I know her for many years. And uh, I told her I was writing this book and blah, blah, blah. And I wanted to give visibility to the artist if she was thinking about something that we could do together. And then she told me, she proposed me to present the book in Paris on the Art Basel week. And I could create a show for all the artists that I wanted to bring to Paris. And I thought it was incredible. So what I wanted is to create the show only like if I will, if I will go buying arts artworks for myself so i contact every artist and i explain them that the the, the 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 exhibition had to be life is beautiful because now my home has this theme life is beautiful because when my son recovered i i i thought that it was so important that every day that you are okay you have to enjoy life like because life is beautiful every day remind yourself that life is precious and we have to be super happy to be in this world. And I was helped by other people, so I always like to help. So I contact all the artists uh, that I could, and I gave the opportunity to 25 artists. We did a um, joint collaboration as well with another gallery, Cal Costiel Gallery, because they are as well sourcing a lot of artworks for my collection, because they have a lot of artists I really like. And then we did it all together. Then. We talked to another friend that he was doing the broadcasting for live painting for three artists. And then we got Tania Marmolejo, yeah. Julie Brodekin, and Sol Felpeto. All three, they are artists from my collection. And I thought it, was good, it would be a very good opportunity for the people to see how talented they are. And because sometimes the people think that when you paint a figure like uh, with big eyes and that looks like childish or whatever, that it's very easy, everybody can do that. No, I mean, they show us how talented they are, the strength behind it, and how in four or five hours can transform a white canvas in something amazing. And they did it. It was so, so inspiring and the people loved it, you know? The other thing I wanted to do during the Paris show was to give the opportunity to all the artists that they wanted to come to Paris to present their artworks in front of, of, of the collectors. So on the day of the opening, we got 300 people coming to see the show. It was very busy. It was so fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then in the middle of the, all the noise and everything, I was stopping and giving the opportunity to the artists to present their artwork because this is very rare that galleries when they do shows, they don't, normally they don't allow them. They don't allow them to move artworks. I moved some artworks around during the exhibition <laughs> as well. And I thought it was very important because it, it, it's, it's, it's very different when you are like a, a young artist or a new collector to see the artist in action, you know? So to see how they paint in action, to see how they present their artwork, it could be like a crucial point for you to think about something that you never thought. And I think it was very successful and the people loved. And it's like when Tania or when Pedro Hoss or with Yuri, Sol, or 
Annabel Faustin, they were presenting their artworks. It was very, very exciting, you know? It and was. It, it created a lot of dialogue between other people. So I like to create dialogue between um, artworks. And this is what I do at home all the time. There's another tip that is incredible because many people have asked me, it's like, how can you put this artwork beside the other one, you know? For instance, many times we inherit an artwork from our grandparents that doesn't fit in our lifestyle. Let's say an artwork or furniture, piece of furniture, you know? But you really want to have it at home because that reminds you your grandmother, your grandfather or your parents, you know? And it's like when you create conversations with old pieces and new pieces, it creates an atmosphere of different generations. And for me, it's the same than, you know, when you have like a Christmas dinner or birthday party with your family and you have the grandmother, the mother, the uncles, the cousins, and it's a lot of people. So for the art, it's the same. You can mix everything. And it creates an incredible good vibrations, you know? Oh, I love that so much. Yeah, it's like have everything tells a story. And even if it's not like this perfectly curated thing, it's something that's part of your life and you can make it work, right? I mm -hmm. love that so much. And I also appreciate that you brought in the artists to speak about their work. I agree. I always love to hear and you always learn something new about you know, the process or the work or the meaning. And it's, it was so fun. It was truly one of the most fun openings I've ever attended. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we really enjoyed so much. And we, it was very um, sporadic for everyone to be able to say what they wanted. Nothing was prepared. They knew they would be able to talk, but they didn't want to prepare. And they really want, they wanted to express how they felt when they did their work and to reach as much audience as possible. And I think uh, they did it. So I hope I can do more more shows like this. I hope so too. You did a beautiful job. And I want to ask you if you could share any tips, how did you find the artists in your collection? Because so many artists, you know, especially when they're just starting out, it just feels like you're completely isolated from the world. And it feels like you're here. And then the art world is like way over there. And you have no idea how to even break in. Just wondering if you could share from your perspective, how did you discover the artists that you have in your collection or artists that you've worked with? Many at the beginning, like some years ago, I didn't have Instagram. Let's say I didn't create my Instagram account in 2019. So I used to discover them always through a local gallery that I used to attend the openings. Then from 2019, everything changed because when I created Instagram, I came into this incredible virtual world <laughs> full of opportunities. <laughs> so, so much. <laughs> so much. So I started following the artists I knew that I was collecting. And some artists that I, that I thought they were like the friends, artists of the other, because many artists, they have other artist friends that they study together with or in their circle. And many times when I bought an artwork from an artist, another artist recommended me their friend. Mm. Then I started like this. And then many now, for instance, now is very different because my, my Instagram account is quite popular. So they contact me directly. <laughs> Yeah, that's so but cool. I would recommend every artist to have Instagram. But, you know, it's very important to have Instagram and to have like a kind of link to their web page. Yes, I agree. If, what is really, really bad is to put the prices. Really? So, yes, in my opinion. I think if you have a web page and you advertise the prices and, and you have 20 hours available, this will stop many people from buying because they think many collectors, and this is where the, the art world is built, like on scarcity, you know? So if there's too much available, they don't want to buy. So if I want to give an uh, advice to artists, I will say, expose your past shows. Don't show everything on your future shows that you are creating. Keep a little, a little bit of mysticism around your profile. Be very active with your collectors and with your audience. Always polite and answer. Instagram, you know, is a little bit like, you know, when you are you, you are walking in your neighborhood and you meet someone you know, but you don't know very well, but sometimes you see just say hello or you meet in the elevator, your neighbor say good afternoon. So Instagram is the same. So if somebody comes to you, you always have to reply. Don't ignore. So just kind of, answer politely whatever you want you know 
And always, I think an artist nowadays need, it's like an obligation to have Instagram, yeah. you know? It's really changed my life, both as in my creative business and with my own art practice. And, you know, we like to complain about social media, but there's so many good parts to it. And it's a free tool that's accessible to everyone, no matter what the budget or background. So I still, even though it has its challenges, I still think it's so powerful. And can I ask you something as a collector? So this is something I, this question I get so much mm -hmm. and that is artists who might feel like they have so much inventory and like you said you don't want to display everything because then it just looks like you know no one wants your stuff well how do you navigate that what are some tips for curating the work that you do have available even if you have like way more in storage or whatever how can artists be that you know a little bit mysterious but also professional and also look like they might be sought after without like you know lying or <laughs> manipulating like what are some techniques they yeah. could try i mean i'm not trying to say that the artist has to manipulate because manipulate the market is no 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 yeah it's just like sometimes they feel you know it's it's not that you said that sometimes i just hear like oh i just feel like i'm being dishonest you know if i'm not putting everything out there <laughs> no not at all because you know it takes maybe, I don't know, one week to finish an artwork for an artist, no? Let's say. And then you have like, I don't know, 50 artworks a year, you know? Mm -hmm. And maybe you sell 20, let's say. So from last year, you have 30 left that you couldn't sell because in this moment, it was not enough demand. Not, the first thing is that you really have to be true to yourself and not everything you paint is sellable. That's right. Okay? So... Always the things for sale and the things you show, they have to be really good. So don't try to do quick things to try to put more things on your web or things like that because the, 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 the audience will perceive that. So only the best pieces, they go for sale. The other ones, you can reuse the canvas and paint on top. That's There's right. another thing, for instance, there are a lot of charity auctions. They could give you a lot of opportunities to show your artwork that you will not be rewarded in, in economic terms, but a lot of people will see your artwork. For instance, I give you an example. Now I am helping to create an, 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 an auction in London for the Royal Society of Arts. Okay. Mm -hmm. The patron is King Charles and all the patrons will be there in the Strand in London, you know, wow. so I'm asking a lot of artists to donate one piece. And this year, in 2024, many artists didn't manage to sell all the pieces, you know, and they have them in the basement. And maybe they don't see, they're not going to see the light for many years or maybe ever, you know. So if you donate one piece for a good cause, like Together for Art, for instance, or any other cause for the flooding of whatever or anything, you know, this artwork will be for one week exhibited in the, for instance, in my case, in the Royal Society of Arts. All the people in London will go and see it. All the art patrons, they will go and see it. And if somebody likes it, maybe that person owns a gallery. Maybe that person is an art patron or somebody, somebody will buy it. And on top of that, all the benefits will go for a good cause. So things like this, that is not an immediate reward for the artist. They could be very rewarding for their future, you know? Mm -hmm. So artists, they have to think that, Maybe like a percentage of the artworks could be used for charitable works and to mentor older art artists, to mentor younger artists as well, you know? And I, th I always believe that every artist, they should have like older artists to, to be mentored from and young artists that they mentor because yes. they learn so much, you know? So 100%. always create a community around you and help each other because... You, you, it's impossible to make it in life alone, you know? Absolutely. So you need to grow with a group of people and you are pushing the group all together up. And this is very important, the networking. So if you are a group of, let's say, 10 artists, that you even can create maybe your uh, annual Christmas show together. Even if the artists, they sell for different prices, you know? But it's a charity event that different audience will come and see, for instance, you know? So all these type of things, they are very important. And to put a web page full of artworks with their prices, with 25, 30, 50 artworks for sale that all <laughs> look like similar with different colors, it's not going to help you. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for sharing that perspective. And I totally agree about the community that changed my whole life. It, it's insane how, you know, how much more fun and, <laughs> and easy it is to navigate when you have all these 
friends and connections and knowing it's not a competition because we can all bring something to the table. Thank you so much for sharing that. And in your opinion, I would love to ask you this too, both for artists and galleries, you know, in this day and age, I know for me, there's not really always a need to have a gallery for artists, especially for young artists. They can pretty much sell directly. But I would love to hear your perspective on when is it important to have a gallery? When What is the role in today's age of contemporary art galleries, both for collectors and artists? If you could share your perspective, that would be so beautiful. I think when an artist starts, doesn't really need a gallery because the first years of being an artist is about experimenting and finding your own style. So once you feel that you have your own style, you can start participating in what I say, like maybe charity events or group shows with other artists, you know, things like that. But when you feel that you already have defined your own style, I think you need a gallery. And the, the galleries are important because they have a networking, you know? And for instance, if you organize a show in your city and maybe with two or three other artists and the local people come and see it and you do it year after year, it's always the same people, you know? How an artist from a small town can reach audience, I don't know. If you are in Philadelphia, how can you reach the audience in New York or in London or in Paris? If, if you don't have a gallery to help you, it's very difficult because you are not going to have the money to do it, you know? So that's why it's very important. So some people feel that, oh, the gallery takes 50% of the revenues. I do, and and I have heard so much from artists saying, I do all the work, I do all the uh, painting, I do the shipping, I even send them the artworks and everything, and they don't do anything, just hang the paintings there, you know? They are paying their rent, they do to art fairs. For instance, one of them, I think one of the very, very important places to be is in art fairs. For instance, in uh, when, the week of Art Basel Miami, okay? I go to Art Basel Miami every year, and then I go to Art Basel maybe one day. Okay. And then the second day, I go to Untitled. I love Untitled. That's my favorite. Yeah, it's <laughs> then I go to Context and Miami. And then I go to Nada. Last year, when I went to Nada, I thought this is one of the best places for a young artist to exhibit. Mm. The ambient was very vibrant. A lot of young collectors, a lot of kids of collecting families that the parents buy in Art Basel on Untitled, there are 25, 30, 35 year old kids, they go to Nada. And it's an art fair with a lot of diverse um, artworks. Some artists, they, they exhibit directly themselves, some small galleries, they represent them, you know? And it was so much action there that I thought, wow, this is the place to be. I, I thought, if I will be a young artist, I want to be in Nada, you know? I love that so much. I love that fair as well. Untitled and Nada are my favorites, probably. Um, both as an artist and as someone who just discovers like such interesting gems and interesting perspectives. Ah, oh, that's such brilliant advice. Thank you for sharing that. I agree. I think there's definitely a role for all of us to play and just to understand like at different parts of the journey, you might need dealers or galleries and um, and art fairs. And maybe at the beginning, that's not the priority. It's like establishing your own workflow and style. But uh, thank you so much. I feel like this podcast is like, Everyone needs to listen to it at least 10 times. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sonia. This has been amazing. And for our listeners as well, I would love to also ask you before I let you go today about your book. I would love, I kind of referenced it throughout our chat, but could you tell me who did you write this book for and what do you hope it teaches people or gives them? Yes, this book is written for, is dedicated to all the artists in my collection because they made me so happy. And uh, I think art, for me, it has been like, it's, I can't say it's a therapy, but it's a style of life, you know? For me, I like, I like to live happy, you know? I like to be happy in life. And when, when you live surrounded with, with art, it's like, a, it, it, it's very different. If you don't have art in your home, it's difficult to understand, but I recommend everybody to buy at least one piece of art and hanging in their home. And they will understand that, that the art is very important. So this book is really dedicated to all the artists in my collection. And I wanted them, all of them to read it 
And I think many they have read it because we reached number one on Amazon on the first week. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of artists were buying it. Also, I have uh, three kids that they are 19, 22 and 24. And they were asking me all the time for advice for their friends because they are, you know, when you are at the university and you want to decorate your, your dorm or you are renting an apartment and you want to have some prints or is it going to be a good investment? In reality, I don't have a lot of money, all these kind of things, you know. So I wanted to have everything in the book. We wrote as well the book with my son, Alexander, that he was my guide. So we didn't have like a shadow writer or anything. He was my guide to keep on a very easy uh, language so everybody could understand. And we really want to reach a lot of young people. So let's say this book is written for artists, for young collectors, and for people that, they, that I want them to understand that when you collect, you will make money eventually. If you are, but if you are only for money, it's better you go to the stock market, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you really want to be happy with the other things that they are not so materialistic because I consider art not like a materialistic thing, even if it's material, it gives you so much in, for your spirit. It's like food for your spirit, let's say. Uh, I think you, you, you really need to understand that it will change your life. And there are, there are two things in, in life that they are free and makes you so happy. And one is a sport. You can go and walk and run and go to the park, exercise. And when you come back, you feel fresh and happy. Yes. The other thing is, for instance, I don't know, maybe you know, in some countries art is not free, but for instance, I live in Europe. In Europe, all the museums are free and all the art galleries are free. So you can, and if you feel lonely in life, many people now, that they are not getting married, they don't have children, they don't have families, they feel lonely, but you always can count on going to a museum, sit there and create a conversation with the person besides. The same with an art gallery. And if you create this as a routine, let's say you go once a week or once in a while to, to, to see art and you will make a lot of art friends and in the future you will be able to enjoy life with them, going traveling for art, going to exhibitions. I travel for art, meeting my friends all the time. And we, my husband before, he didn't like so much art, but now he can't resist. <laughs> husband, <you know? laughs> Good job on converting him. <laughs> so I want to convert many people because <laughs> when you are um, in tough days in your life, going through anything, law, a loss, a divorce, bad time in the job, anything, La the, 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 the art can change so much yeah, the, the, the way of thinking and put everything in perspective you know so I really, really recommend the people I recommend the people to read the book of course but if they don't want to read it at least go to museums and enjoy <laughs> art and feel it uh, and let the art to call you I love that so much and, and also read the book it's very good <laughs> 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 Sonia, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you for taking out time for our community and our listeners to share your beautiful perspectives and your wisdom and your tips. Where can our listeners find you? What else do you have going on? What can we, you know, keep an eye on? What do you have happening? So I have my webpage, soniabibilondon.com and my Instagram account. And now uh, there are a lot of things uh, coming that uh, I'm creating something in Saudi Arabia. I'm creating some things in China. Wow. Yes, in Hong Kong, uh, many, many, many things. And the other thing I want to do is uh, in, during 2025, I will write another book that it will be like a small book as well with drawings for children. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's I'm so excited for it. <laughs> so when the parents, they bring the, the children to the museum, they have, the book for mom and dad and the book for the child because I believe that you need to educate your kids from when you are they are young and is creativity is such a big resource that you can give your kids for any problems in life you know that I think that many it's like undervalue it's, it's like a tool that it will it will help you to come out from any situation even if you're a businessman a lawyer um anything 
it's going to help you so much to solve a mathematical problem or when you don't have money to 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 create the um, savory dishes in your kitchen you know anything so i just want to attract a lot of people to the art world so mm. thank you so thank much thank you thank you for doing this important work and thank you so much for sharing it with us on the show it was so lovely to be here today thank you so much Kat. thank you